Let's get into our text here. Matthew chap- chapter 13, uh, reading through verses 1 through 23. It says, On the same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea, and great multitudes were gathered together to him, so that he got into a boat and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places, where they did not have much earth. And they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? He answered and said to them, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For whoever has, to him more will be given, and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you, sh- you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull, their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed." lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For assuredly, I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who received seed by the wayside. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but only endures it for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Now he who received seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. But he who received seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some 60, some 30. Well, praise God. What a blessing to be in God's word together today and to just hear and uh, receive from the Lord his goodness and grace and love. Michael, did you connect to my phone? Really, does that do something? Mm-hmm. It says you've, you've connected to me. <laughs> I've never seen that, yeah. And Michael, he's dangerous. <laughs> he's too smart. He'll know. <laughs> Help, get me out of here. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, hey, Lord, we just want to pray, Father, that you would speak to us now through your precious word, that, Lord, you would uh, fill our hearts to overflowing with your love and your grace, and that, Father, we would respond to the exhortation that is here. That, Lord, um, it, it really, the ball is in our court. You have done everything that you could possibly do to save us and to give us every chance in this life through the power of your Holy Spirit. 
And now it's just up to us to receive that gift and to walk in your spirit and not quench the spirit or grieve the spirit. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would stir us up to be zealous for you and to be actively involved in what you have for us to be involved in in our lives. Lord, help us not to become complacent, to look back over the shoulder, to regret our sacrifices to you that we've already made, and to weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap a bountiful harvest. So Lord, we pray that you would give us that steadfast, unmovable spirit that knows that our master is in control and that he will bring to us what he has for us. So Lord, we cast our cares upon you this morning. We rest in your love. We thank you, Lord, for your protection and your peace over your people. And Lord, for your work that is going on in Israel as Israel is um, negotiating with Hamas. I pray, Father, that you would give them wisdom. It's not a good idea to negotiate with those who just want your destruction. But uh, Lord, thank you that there have been returned hostages. And we pray for more, Lord. And we pray for peace in Jerusalem. And we pray for the revival of your people. So God, we're just looking to you and we're trusting in you for our lives and what you have for us. And thank you that we can be a part of your plan of redemption. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, what a blessing it is to live at this time and to experience what we're experiencing. Man, it's incredible. Um, I think we're in an exciting time as, as the disciples were when Jesus showed up on the shores of Galilee and revealed himself to them. We're in a, an equally exciting time with the Spirit leading us and awakening our souls and directing us in a walk with him and seeing prophecies that have sat dormant for thousands of years. I, I mean, just comprehend that for a moment. Prophecies that have sat dormant for a thousand years being literally fulfilled. Like Isaiah eleven fourteen, literally fulfilled. It's just incredible. God's regathered his people. It's happening. There's still more to come. There's more to be regathered. Uh, <clears throat> people are confused. They, they don't know their Old Testament. They're not familiar with the scriptures and that they're easily uh, swayed or confused or lost. But uh, boy, just read the scriptures. Get into the word, start learning, and read it at face value. Take it like a child. Uh, that's how the Lord says that we're to enter the kingdom of heaven, like a little child. Don't, don't try to overthink the scriptures. You, you really get messed up when you do, when you think you're smarter than them. And you know more, well, that can't mean that. It has to mean this, because we know this. Well, really, really, do we really know that? Or have you just swallowed the Kool-Aid? So be careful that you don't do that, but that you read the word at face value. You know, Isaiah eleven fourteen says that Ephraim and Judah as one will fly down upon the Philistines. And that's exactly what happened. And like all the way down to uh, they flew. You know, I mean, it's like, yeah, that's figurative. To fly down is to move swiftly. Uh, no, they literally flew. They were dropping bombs all on Gaza. And, and I mean, how literal can you get with a, a prophecy like that? It's like, wow, Lord, you chose the word fly. Wow, you don't mess around. So I marvel at the word of God, and I marvel at his accuracy, and I can't wait to just watch it unfold, line upon line, precept upon precept. Not one jot, not one tittle will pass away till all is fulfilled. So it's worth reading, and it's worth paying attention to. And yes, there's a lot there. But what else are you going to do for the rest of your life? <laughs> you know? Uh, I was thinking of... Uh, we were watching Victoria, the TV show, Victoria. And, and it's funny because that's even a contradiction in what I'm about to say. You will see. But um, the queen is playing cards with her friends. And Albert says to the queen, you should really practice the piano more. And she says, I don't have time to practice the piano. And he says, but you have time to play cards. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I don't have time to learn my Bible 
but you watch Victoria. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I don't mean, mean that to con condemn you, but to convict you. <laughs> well, hey, <clears throat> here we are in Matthew chapter 13, and this is an, another uh, transition, another change, and his disciples catch it, and you'll see that in the text. They ask him, you know, why do you speak in parables? Because he hadn't been doing that before. And so you have to understand in the context what's happening here. Chapters 11 and 12 reveal that Israel is now beginning to reject their Messiah. Most of them, it's not a bold stand in your face and call you Satan kind of rejection. That's the leadership. Israel themselves, it was... Um, indifference. Uh, I don't really need to come to a conclusion on who Jesus is. Um, I'll let the experts do that. I'll let the authorities. I'm not smart enough to know whether a guy who raises the dead is God or not. And isn't that uh, kind of crazy? Because, well, it's really crazy to watch the series of miracles that Jesus did and how every one of his miracles equaled the power of God in the Old Testament. And you'll notice that he did all his miracles without asking permission. He just did them. Lazarus, come forth. Just bold statements, not, uh, Lord, if it be your will, would you, you know, heal this lame man? Let's just be healed. Go, as your faith, faith is, so it will be done to you. Now go. Go. And this kind of power being displayed, really, you can't figure out who's standing in front of you. Growing up in the scriptures, learning the scriptures, you can't figure out who's in front of you. And so Jesus says, you will be condemned, Capernaum, Bethsaida, Chorazin. You will be condemned on the day of judgment by those who saw less and yet believed. Nineveh repented at the preaching of Jonah, and so did Solomon in his reputation bring the queen of the south, Beth, uh, the queen of Sheba, all the way from the south up to see the king in his glory. And you've seen greater, and you still sit indifferent, without a changed heart, without a changed life, without a changed motive. You have not changed your direction, repented in any way. You have stayed on the same path. You have not changed your course. The gospel has not affected your life. Therefore, they will condemn you on the day of judgment. Isn't that sobering? So close, yet so far away. So now what Jesus is doing is he's leaving the synagogue behind. And he's leaving, not that he didn't go again, but preaching in the synagogues. We're not going to read about it in Matthew. Or the teaching. It's now parables and parables only. And we're going to talk more about that. But you have to understand that this is what's happening, and it's not because God has suddenly had a mood change. And he's just suddenly woke up one morning, I'm tired of people and I'm grumpy. <laughs> I'm tired of coffee and I'm tired of life. And he just changes his mood, and now he's just going to ignore you, not give you what you need anymore. No, this is judicial judgment and mercy all at the same time. Look, I've given you everything you need to believe, and you haven't believed. The authority, the religious leaders say Jesus does what he does by the power of Satan. In fact, he's Satan himself. And with that kind of opposition and bold rejection of reality. That's what it is. Bold rejection of reality and soundness in thinking. Jesus says, I'm done. I'm not going to keep heaping on you guilt 
the more I reason with you, the more guilty you are. And you are stubborn and you are set in your ways and you're not going to change your course. So I'm not going to talk to you directly anymore. That's mercy. But it's also judgment. We're done here. You will face the consequence of your unbelief. That's judgment. So there is a season, and Israel has had their season. You and I, we have spent over three years going through the first 12 chapters, and we have seen the evidence that Jesus truly is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. And if that evidence has not convinced you as you have systematically gone through with us these evidences, then nothing will convince you. And you're just going to have to face the consequences of your unbelief. Wow, that's sobering. But it's also incredible to see God at work and uh, his, his statements here. So let's go ahead and jump into our text. Enough with the introduction. It says, on the same day, what was the same day? Remember, he was in the house. He was teaching the multitudes and the scribes and Pharisees from Jerusalem are outside uh, murmuring that he is doing what he does by the power of Satan because he was healing people, casting out demons, doing incredible things. And they said, well, he does what he does by the power of Satan. And as he addressed them in, in the house, he calls them over. He addresses their, their unreasonable logic. Then his family, his family, his brothers, his half-brothers, his mother are outside to collect him. And Mark tells us, because they think he's out of his mind, he's playing with fire, he's playing with danger, he's playing with those who could kill him, and he's going to get into trouble. Uh, you forget who I am. Who are my brother, my sister, and my mother? but those who do the will of my Father. And so that was our last exhortation we looked at. And he gave it in the house to all the crowds that had crowded into that house and were around listening. And now he goes out to address the multitude, but he no longer speaks to them plainly, but only in parables. On the same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea. That's the Sea of Galilee. He's there in Capernaum where he has done most of his miracles. And great multitudes were gathered together to him so that he got into a boat and sat. And the whole multitude stood on the shore. And there's a picture here. There's a picture, a typology that's happening here. Jesus customarily was in the crowd and he was thronged by the crowd, and he ministered, and he healed. But now the healing is done, and he's separating himself from Israel. He's, he's called judgment forth for their rejection, and he is now in the boat, separated out in the sea. And it, what's interesting is that the sea is a picture of the Gentile world. The land is a picture of Israel. And the sea is a picture of the Gentile world. And it is a foreshadowing of because re they reject the gospel. Paul says this plainly in Acts chapter 13. Because you guys have deemed yourselves unfit for salvation, we're done. We're going to the Gentiles. And so the Gentiles rejoice. Yeah, they're coming to us. <laughs> And that's been the scenario for the last 1,900, almost 2,000 years. That has been the scenario. That there has been an overwhelming rejection by Israel. There's always been a remnant. Do not misunderstand. There are wonderful Messianic Jews. But for the most part, it has been the Gentile world that's received the gospel and the churches have grown and flourished. And this work is going to change back to Israel and we're seeing the transition right now as we speak. People don't understand what's going on. They, they don't believe Israel is a part of prophecy, that it's all about the church. Oh, big mistake. 
You're watching a transition. The church will soon be raptured, and Israel will be God's full focus on earth. And the tribulation will be built around bringing Israel back to himself, purified and ready for the kingdom work that God called them to in the first place. Exciting! I get chills while saying it. I mean, I'm telling you, I believe this stuff with all my heart. It's like, I've been in the Word too long to, to hesitate for a moment. And so there's a separation between Jesus and the people of Israel for a time. Jesus will say, you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Oh, they're being warmed up as we speak. And uh, there's a few more wars to go just to not get you too ahead of what's happening here. A couple more wars, but um, let's go ahead and look at verse 3. Verse 3, he's down by the sea. Then he spoke many things to them in parables. Uh, actually, verse 2 is what I wanted to focus on. He's, as he sat in the boat, where was he? Well, you know, there's, it's interesting. Uh, as you go to Israel, you can see how small the Sea of Galilee is and how small the, the town of Capernaum. It was not a huge city. It was a fishing village where Jesus spent most of his time and did most of his miracles. And so uh, the topography there, there is a place that is just one mile. It's one mile from Capernaum. And here's a picture above. I, I love this photograph. It just lays it out nice. Um, one mile up above there in the north is Capernaum, and just south is the Cove of the Sower. This is a traditional site. So I, I really stress this. This is traditional, but it's not just traditional because there's no evidence. The evidence is this little cove is uniquely designed to capture sound. It's a natural amphitheater. And they have actually tested this, which uh, I am absolutely fascinated with. They've had a preacher stand down here at the water's edge and preach. And people were listening all the way up here and could hear him perfectly. And the, it's a bull shape. This is all elevated here, and it goes up all the way up to this mountain peak here and back down. They believe this was the ancient road that this road is built upon. And so travelers coming by could hear Jesus speaking. People were stopped. They were gathered all the way to the shore. They were standing there listening. And they would be able to hear him, and they say 5,000, 7,000 could absolutely fit in this area. And so... Um, I found that absolutely interesting. Here's another shot of it. Just show you a series of pictures of it. Beautiful little cove. This is standing on the shore looking up. And to show you the size of it, these are people. These are all people here. There's people on the rocks up here around this light pole that are listening. There they are. Here's... Here's some people sitting on these rocks looking down. This is the view. And Jesus could speak. These people could hear the preacher perfect. I, I mean, I think that's just awesome. And then, of course, off the water, you even have more amplification. The sound bounces off of water uh, nicely. So uh, there's a boat. I love this. This is an 1800s, some fishermen, Arab fishermen out of Ti um, Tiberias. And uh, right there on the Sea of Galilee. What I, what's fascinating to me is they found a boat that's identical to this one. Uh, that, that was dated back to the time of Christ. First century Israel. And so that's the, the, the building pattern hadn't changed much uh, over the last you know, 1800 years. Because this was uh, taken in the 1800s. And so you could just picture Jesus sitting there in the boat some disciples holding it or anchoring it as he taught the people and they listened to him. And uh, so that brings us to uh, verse three. Then he spoke many things to them in parables saying, now let's talk about parables before we go any farther. Uh, parable, it means to lay aside of, to lay something 
next to something else for comparison. And how Jesus uses parables in the biblical term of parables is to lay an earthly concept next to a heavenly truth so that the heavenly truth can be better understood. Okay? So something that's really common, something that's very familiar to the people in their daily lives is compared to a spiritual truth and it brings further insight and understanding about that truth. Jesus is now going into uncharted territory. That is a mystery, and he'll reveal this in verse 11, that this was a mystery that was kept secret. A biblical mystery is not some riddle that you have to figure out. It's something God didn't tell you, but now is telling you. And because it's new revelation... It's called a mystery, the mystery that is now revealed. And this term is used throughout the New Testament. Jesus is revealing mystery after mystery to his people through his Holy Spirit. Uh, and uh, there's all kinds of uh, truths that God is teaching uh, through uh, his wisdom to us and we, uh, the revealing of mysteries. But um, these parables are going to be revealed mysteries. Things that Israel didn't understand about their Messiah. Things they didn't comprehend. Because even though it is prophesied in the Old Testament, it was inconceivable. That Israel would reject their Messiah? Oh, they could never accept that fact. And yet, their Messiah was a stumbling block to them. They stumbled over his sacrifice and suffering. And therefore, he was rejected by all of Israel for, for um, a long time. And so now um, Jesus is teaching about this time period that we call the church age. What will life be like for you apostles and those who follow after you? And so I find this chapter extremely enlightening and a huge blessing for us that we could understand our world today is still under the teaching of Jesus here and the descriptions that he's giving to us. And so, good stuff here as we continue on. Let's look at part B of verse 3. Behold, a sower went out to sow. A sower went out to sow. Now, Jesus is talking uh, this parable to the multitudes without explanation, and that's how we're going to look at it this week. Next week, part 2, we will look at the explanation in detail and break it down. There's just too much here to try to capture it all in one Sunday. So um, this region, this is the Galilee. This is the Sea of Galilee here. And you can see even today the agriculture dominates the land of the Galilee. It's an incredible fertile land. And in, back in Jesus' day, it was no different. And so sowing reaping. This was all a common sight and something extremely familiar. Most of them did this type of thing for themselves. And so as Jesus begins to talk about the sower, he's not talking about anything that anybody has to go look up in an encyclopedia. This is like super rubber meets the road. Yeah, we get it. Okay. Here's a picture in the 1800s of a, of a um, uh, Arab sowing uh, seed on the Mount of Olives. Isn't that cool? I like these old pictures. I kind of geek out on them. You can see the Dome of the Rock in the background. Or is, that's probably not the Dome of the Rock, is it? Or is it? I see the wall, but that might be something different. I, maybe the Dome. Anyway, there's the Mount of Olives. He's throwing the seed out. Notice the style of throwing. It's called broadcasting. It's not specifically planting along a furrow. It's just casting the seed out and covering the field in which you've prepared. And every year they would prepare the field anew because the rain season would expose new rock. It's the rockiest place on the planet. I'm not kidding. It's incredibly rocky. And, um, and so they would prepare their soil and then they would lay their seed and the seed would fly in and Jesus is talking about the seed landing on different prepared soils. Now, soil is soil. It's all soil, okay? But there's different conditions of the soil depending on the preparation 
of the farmer. And that's uh, where you see this perfect balance between God's sovereign work in your life and your responsibility to respond. The farmer knows it well. Does he make the seed? No. Did he invent the hydraulic cycle? No. He just takes advantage of what is, and he prepares the most productive way he can uh, for his, his, his crops. So he tills the ground, he prepares the soil, but it's God who brings the, the increase. It's God who does the miracle of life. That these seeds are thrown into the ground and up comes a crop. And this is exactly the Christian life. We have been called by the Spirit of God into the family of God through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he has prepared us, but now it's our turn to prepare the soil of our hearts. And uh, we'll talk more about that. It's easy to get ahead. This is what it says in verse 4. As he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. And so the pathway, the wayside, there were paths all through. This is Mount Tabor in the background, and uh, a wheat field there in the Jezreel Valley. That's where Armageddon will take place. Uh, Jesus' home, Nazareth, was just beyond this mountain, out of sight there, but in the same valley at the top on the other side. Megiddo on this side, and Jezreel, lots of places you read about in the Bible. Gideon fought against the Midianites right here on this open ground uh, by night. It was actually on the other side of the mountain, the back side. And so there's, there's so many Bible stories that happen right here. But uh, here's the path the wayside. And this is where people walked and the dirt's compacted and pressed in. Therefore, when the seed is cast there, it sits on the surface. It's easy to spot for the birds of the air and the birds come and snatch it away. We'll talk more about that next week. When the sun, oh, now let's read five and six. That's, I'm giving you just little quotes for each section to look at, but uh, let's read verses five and six. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched and because they had no root, they withered away. And so this is also common in Israel. There's a lot of um, limestone in Israel, and there will be soil on top, and so you can have thin layers of soil, but rock bed underneath. And a lot of the rock bed, you'll notice, has pits, pittings. And so in the rainy season, those, those, those pits will fill up with, with uh, water, and they'll also fill up with soil. But they're very shallow. And so the immediate response of the seed in these shallow conditions is to spring up because they have moisture. That's what activates seed, it's water. So they have the moisture, but the moisture doesn't last. As soon as the sun comes up, the puddles dry up. Um, because there's no depth, the plant is unable to drive roots deep. So it does most of its growing up. So its initial reaction looks huge. It's like, wow, look at this crop here is springing up fast. But when the sun comes and scorches it, it withers away. It doesn't last and it doesn't produce fruit. It doesn't produce fruit. That's key to what Jesus is talking about. There's the sun coming up over the fields uh, there, it, uh, just beyond Mount Hermon there sun coming up to the east. So Matthew 13, 7. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. Now, thorns are a problem in Israel as well as here. I know what uh, is a common practice is they have a, a special chemical compound they use that weeds love. So what they'll do is they'll spray their field with this, this chemical and, and water it, and it will activate the weeds. 
Like they'll just shoot right up. And the purpose is so that they can collect all the dormant seeds in their field. They will till the ground again and pull out all those weeds and they won't have a weed problem for five years. It'll take five years for the seeds to slowly blow back in by the weather. And so uh, it's an interesting practice. Well, here is the problem with untilled ground is the weeds grow faster, take over uh, quickly, and choke out the seed. And so the seed, once again, doesn't bear fruit. But now we come to verse 8. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundred, some sixty, some thirty. Now that's unique. The average crop production is seven times, sevenfold. That's the average uh, for uh, growing crops. But here's a hundredfold. That's 10,000%. 60-fold is 6,000%, 30-fold, 3,000%. I wouldn't complain about any one of those crops. That is like way more than expected. 3,000% more than what you planted. Wow. So that's good fruit. What Jesus is talking about is extreme fruit for those who are good ground. The seed that fell on the good ground produced and yielded a great crop. The head of grain where, where the wheat kernel is wrapped in the, the chaff or the, the, the crust there and much fruit provided for food for the people. And this is what Jesus is telling. But now he indicates really important, listen up. That wasn't just a cutesy story education for the first grade class <laughs> yeah i thought i'd just teach the kids today on how it goes with crops <laughs> he says he who has an ear let him hear this is an exhortation that is given to us many times in scripture uh, jesus says this to every church in the book of revelation the seven churches he who has an ear let him hear what the spirit says to the churches with every exhortation, it applies to everyone. With every church, it applies to everyone who will hear. And so it's listen up, pay attention. There's a spiritual depth here. There's spiritual meaning behind this story that you need to search out. What's interesting is the multitude didn't care to search it out. It shows you where their hearts were. The parables were not a problem for the multitude. The fact that they didn't fully understand, maybe scratch their heads about these stories and what did they really mean, didn't really bother them, but it bothered the true disciples. They came, they asked. That's the difference. There are many who just will not seek out the truth no matter how close it is. They won't go for it. Verse 10 the disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? And we've already addressed this. Jesus began speaking to them in parables because their hearts were hard. They weren't willing to listen or change their lives for who Jesus was and what he was there to do. So he answered and said to them in verse 11, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For whoever has, to him more will be given. And he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. So Jesus is warning. And this is going to be repeated in Matthew 25 again. It's the same idea as to whom much has been given much will be required. And he says, look, if you don't take what you have and use it, you will lose it. Have you heard that phrase? If you don't use it, you'll lose it. Boy, I can tell you so many things I have learned that I have unlearned. 
but I cannot recall because I did not use it. And Jesus is saying this is true for faith as well. That those who have received light from the Lord, think of all the light that Israel received from Jesus. This was not just an overnight change. This was a gradual rejection that culminated in this moment when Jesus no longer speaks to them plainly. And this is the same thing that can happen in your life and in my life. Through a hard heart, through rejecting truth, I have personally gone down that road where uh, having a hard heart against the Lord and against his word and and longing and, and chasing after sin rather than righteousness in the Lord that I just began to lose even my knowledge of the word of God. It was amazing. I remember a period where I got bored. I was reading, this is in high school, I was reading through um, Chronicles and I was reading through the, uh, all the names, the really exciting names that you find there in Chronicles, the first <laughs> nine chapters. And I got, I don't know, chapter three and I just fizzled out, dropped my Bible and didn't pick it up for three months. In that three months, I found my life completely in ruins. I was like losing my faith. I was losing my focus. I was so distracted with everything that was going on in my life and in my world. And I was disrespectful to my teachers, which produced disrespectful fruit to my parents and uh, pride, the whole thing. And, And I just realized, Lord, my life is so far from you. It has no reflection or bearing on you and who you are. Help me. And I remember him speaking to me. He says, go back to what you used to do. Get back into my word. And I said, oh, oh yeah, okay. I picked up my Bible. I opened up to First Chronicles chapter 4. <laughs> I read a chapter, and I have to be honest, I did not know pretty much every name. I got nothing intellectually out of that chapter. But here's what I noticed when I put the Bible down. A heart change. A different spirit was in me. More peace, more patience. I found myself recalling scriptures that I once knew and could easily recall that I had lost in that three months. I'm I'm serious. I'm not joking around. That I, I truly believe my gift of, of scripture recall is from the Lord. And it's his unction, it's his spirit working in me to be able to recall his scriptures. And when I, when I walk in disobedience, he just begins to withhold. And I just feel like, Lord, I need you. And so this dependence on him is precious to me. In my pride, in my youth, I didn't like it that I had to be dependent on the Lord. Now I love it. I love it, and it's precious to me. And so he speaks to them in parables that they would not understand. And so let's go ahead and keep reading. He says, you have been given this privilege to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because you're seeking. But... Verse 13 says, therefore I speak to them in parables. Because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, hearing you will hear and not and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. For the heart of this people have grown dull, their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. Jesus is saying, I speak to them in parables because I've already spoken to them plainly, and when I did, They shut their ears and their eyes to me. This reminds me of when Stephen stood before the Sanhedrin and he spoke the the word of God and the resurrection of Christ. He gave them the gospel and he reminded them of their history. Guys, when did Israel ever accept the will of God for their lives? 
when Moses was brought to be their deliverer, did he accept them? No, they said, who made you judge over us? And they pushed him out and he had to flee into the wilderness for 40 years. And then God brought him back and the people still murmured, grumbled, and complained the whole way through until they were delivered. And once they were in the wilderness, did they start to obey? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, the wilderness was quite the experience for Moses. It brought him to his wit's end. How about David? God anoints him as king by Samuel the prophet. No, they didn't accept him. Joseph, going backward to Genesis. This beloved brother that walked in the will of God, oh, rejected by his brothers, sold as a slave. And so as Stephen reaccounted their history of rebellion and said, you guys are no different. God sent his son and you guys hung him on a tree. You crucified him and he brings condemnation to them. It says that they covered their ears and gnashed their teeth and charged at him, drug him outside and stoned him to death. This is what Jesus is saying. This is how hard their hearts are in rejecting the Lord. So I'm going to stop speaking to them plainly and not throw my pearls before swine I'm going to speak to them in parables, and those who want to know will seek the truth. And if you seek me, you will find me. And this is how God is working even today. Those who want the truth can find the truth. Verse 16 and 17 for, well, here's Isaiah. I almost forgot. Got a picture of the great school. They call it the great school of Isaiah. This is in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's there in um, Israel, in Jerusalem, in the, the uh, scrolls, the uh, museum. It's really cool to go there and see these things. And that's the verse itself, Isaiah 6, 9, and 10. And, and what this proves to us is this was not a shock to God. The rejection of Israel was prophesied. They will have hard hearts, dull of hearing. Uh, they will not see. They will close themselves to the Messiah. And therefore, they will not see and they will not hear. So that's why Jesus says, this is fulfillment. I speak them to, in parables as fulfillment of the prophet Isaiah. Wow, another scripture fulfilled in the life of Christ. Ezekiel 33, 11, though, says... As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? Understand that it's not that God is withholding information from some and giving information to others. That's not how it's, it works. Everyone is given light in their life and truth. Everyone. Everyone has the potential for salvation through the power of the Spirit, through the grace of God. Everyone. Old Testament, New Testament. Afar off or near. The eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are directed to him. But what does the scripture say? No one has sought after God at any time. No, not one. All we like sheep have gone, our, gone astray, each to our own way, but the Lord has laid upon himself the iniquity of us all. So hard hearts is the commonplace. That's what you have to understand. Why are there so few saved? Because it's not true and we're fanatics? Or because it is true and they're hard-hearted? Unwilling to repent or turn. And God's heart's cry is that all would be saved that all would repent and come to the truth. Isaiah 28, 11, For with stammering lips and another tongue, he will speak to his people. This is the next judgment coming. I wanted to point it out at this moment because this is after the cross. This is at the birth of the church. God prophesied that he would speak to Israel in their rejection of their Messiah. He would speak to them by the Gentile world. Those who speak another language... And the sign of it, tongues on the day of Pentecost, was a sign of judgment to rejecting Israel. 
but a sign to the church of the presence and power of God through the Holy Spirit. So tongues is a twofold ministry. It brings judgment on those who would not believe. And it says, I'm no longer talking to you in a language you can understand. I'm only going to speak to you in a language you don't know. That's the same idea of parables. Parables was the first step. Next, it's tongues. But then there will be restoration because Israel will be made jealous by the church. Paul says this. God's using the church to make Israel jealous. And I've been to Israel twice, and both times I saw it in action. Jealous of those Christian pilgrims just geeking out over all those biblical sites. Oh, Jesus was here! I can't believe it! Lord, I can't believe what you did right here! And the guide is standing there going, wish I loved my God like you love your God. One of our guides said that to us. It's like, yeah, well, you can. He's your Messiah. I borrowed him. <laughs> Not really, but <laughs> we've been grafted in. Hey, let's wrap up. We'll last two verses here. But blessed are your eyes, he says to his disciples, for they see and your ears, for they hear. For assuredly, I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desire to see desired to see what you see and did not see it and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. This is going along the very same thought that we read earlier when <clears throat> Jesus said, those civilizations that came to see the work of God with a lesser light than me will condemn you on the day of judgment. He now says to his disciples, you are blessed because you've seen and you've heard the Messiah. You've seen and heard the grace of God, the mercy of God, the forgiveness of God. Who knew that God was going to sacrifice himself for our sins? Who thought that an unrighteous person, a person who's chosen the wrong path and the wrong life could have the hope of redemption, the hope of forgiveness and the hope of eternal life? How blessed are these disciples to look into the face of God himself and see a smile. What a blessing. And so he says, you are blessed because you have seen and many have desired to see it and have not seen it. 1 Corinthians 2, 9 and 10, but as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor has it entered in the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But, this is a, a big, this is important, but God, but God has revealed them to us through his spirit. You see, that's not claiming you can know nothing about heaven and about the future. That's actually saying the opposite. This world can know nothing about the future because they don't believe in the one who knows the future, holds the future, and fulfills the future. But we, his people, can know these things. How? God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. They are spiritually discerned. The natural man cannot know the things of the spirit, nor can he understand them. But the spirit bears with our spirit. He yearns within us and he speaks the truths that are found in his word and lights our hearts on fire. This is the work of the living God. And this is what Jesus is saying is such a blessing for them. Because you have heard and seen. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. Hallelujah. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's what Peter said and was blessed because of it. 1 Peter 1, 10 
Of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. See that beautiful grace. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. Yes, there were sufferings Christ must suffer. Yes, church, there are sufferings you must suffer. But do not be discouraged. There is a greater glory to follow. The sufferings of this life are not to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For that refining work, like an oyster making a pearl, irritant, that sand that gets into the shell of an oyster, works on it, works on it, trying to get rid of that irritating thing, and what has happened? A pearl. And You and I, in our suffering, are making pearls, and we don't even realize it. We're going to see all that glorious pearl work when we get to heaven and we'll thank god oh thanks lord for irritating me all the time and <laughs> causing me to suffer i didn't realize it was so fruitful after all fertilizer stinks but it works <laughs> conclusion matthew 13 12 whoever has to him more will be given and he will have abundance jesus said whosoever will come unto me I will in no way cast out. There's an open opportunity for you. I've been on that freeway in LA, stuck in traffic. One time I was there for three hours in a Volkswagen bug in the summer. I did not have air conditioning. It was miserable. I swore I'd never go through that again. Uh, but that's in God's hands. I may have to drive a Volkswagen back through LA one day. <laughs> But as I was sitting there, I was overwhelmed by the multitude of people. I was at the freeway junction where there were three freeways converging. You know the spot. I'm sitting there, and there's just every freeway is stopped. And I go, Lord, there are so many people in the world. How do you even know me? How do you even know what's going on in my life? And the Lord just began to minister to me. It was right there in that old blue bug. <laughs> it was so sweet. And the Lord knows you. He knows your life. And he has you in the palm of his hand. Let's stand together. Ah, oh, thank you, Lord, for your precious word. Thank you, Lord, for your life, your love. Thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you for revealing to us your truth. Lord, if there's anyone here who hasn't yet come to the light, hasn't yet responded in repentance, turning from their sin, changing their course in the new revelation of there being a God who loves them and the grace that is upon them and the, the call of the Spirit to have this relationship with the living God and be in the family of God and be forgiven of all your sins and, yes, suffer with the people of God and be a part of that kingdom and see the glory that is revealed through your kingdom work in us. Oh, God, invite them in. Bring them in, even now. Lord, you say there's no room for cowards in the kingdom of God, that there won't be, uh, there, uh, no coward will enter the new Jerusalem. Lord, we need to be brave. We need to step in. We need to be focused. We need to move calculated according to your word and according to your promises. And I pray you would give us the faith to do so. In Jesus' name, amen.